Hello everyone, my name is Johnny Bertka and I'm the president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. I would like to welcome you to the second debate in our Diana Davis Spencer debate series. This series is a partnership between the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and Wheaton College in Massachusetts. We'd like to thank the generosity of our sponsor today, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, for making this series possible. The purpose of our debate series is to promote the free exercise of speech and to model civil discourse at a time when many, when many people believe that our country is more divided now than it's ever been in the past. The topic of today's debate is nationalism. Specifically, what are the merits of nationalism? Since the Brexit referendum in 2016 and the election of Donald Trump, there's been an increase in nationalist rhetoric and nationalist political movements sweeping the United States, Europe, and throughout the world. This debate has opened up many long-held issues of the bipartisan consensus that emerged after the, the end of the Cold War and has forced many people to re-examine their assumptions relating to issues like foreign policy, immigration policy, and trade policy. And today we have the privilege of having two esteemed guests uh, who will explore beyond the surface and really help to plumb the depths of some of the most important questions facing our nation, having to do with citizenship, patriotism, and also the shared obligations that we have to each other and to those throughout the world. So please welcome uh, Dr. Yasha Mounk and Dr. David Azarad. Dr. Mounk is an associate professor of practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University. He is known for his work on the rise of populism and the crisis of liberal democracy, and his most recent book, The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, has been translated into 10 languages and was recognized as the best book of 2018 by the Financial Times and several other publications. He's a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund, a senior advisor at the Protect Democracy Project, and a contributing editor at The Atlantic. Yasha's writings appear frequently in publications such as The New Yorker and Foreign Affairs, and he is the host of a popular podcast entitled The Good Fight. Dr. Mounk received his BA in History from Trinity College, Cambridge, and his PhD in Government from Harvard University. He also recently started an online journal called Persuasion. Welcome, Dr. Mounk. Thank you so much. And Dr. David Azrad is an assistant professor and research fellow at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, D.C. His writing and research focuses on classical liberalism, conservative political thought, and identity politics. Prior to joining Hillsdale, uh, David was the director of the B. Kenneth Simon Center in Principles and Politics at the Heritage Foundation. His writings have appeared in numerous publications, including the Claremont Review of Books, the Weekly Standard, National Affairs, First Things, The Times of London, and Interpretation, a Journal of Political Philosophy. He has also appeared on national television in the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. Dr. Azarad received a doctoral degree in politics from the University of Dallas, where he wrote a dissertation on the foundations of John Locke's political thought. He received an MA in political science from Carleton University in Ottawa and a BA in journalism and political science from Concordia University in Montreal. Welcome, Dr. Azarad. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and now for the plan for today's debate. Each participant will have five minutes to make their opening statements. Um, following that, I will ask a series of questions and then we'll turn things over to our live audience of Wheaton College students to uh, hear their thoughts and get their questions. And then we will conclude with three minutes of closing remarks from each of you. So with, uh, without further ado, uh, let's begin with Dr. Azarad. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for agreeing to participate. So what are the merits of nationalism? Well, I think it all depends on which nation and which nationalism we're talking about. You see, the merits of nationalism are not only going to vary from nation to nation, the term itself has different meanings. And I'd like to illustrate this briefly by talking about the three nations from which I hail. My father's from Israel, my mother's from France, and I was born and raised in Quebec in Canada. So if you go back to the turn of the last century and you look at the early Zionist movement, I think that the case for Jewish nationalism, the idea that the Jewish people should have a sovereign homeland, is quite compelling, or was quite compelling at the time. And today, the flourishing state of Israel is a testimony to the success of Zionism. By contrast, I don't find the case for Quebecois nationalism all that compelling. And neither do most Canadians, or Quebecers for that matter, because Quebec remains a part of Canada after two failed attempts to gain its independence. If you look at the whole world, 
I think, I hope we can all agree that it is clearly not possible and not desirable for all of the stateless people in the world to have their own country. So the merits of any particular nationalist movement are going to depend on a wide range of considerations, which are not really going to occupy me today because I'm not here the, to debate in abstract the merits of what I would call aspirational nationalism. There are just too many particulars that go into deciding what should be done in each and any case. There is, however, another kind of nationalism that exists in countries like France, for example, that have been independent for longer than anyone can remember. And in this context, nationalism generally speaks to a sovereign people's desire to preserve their national sovereignty, to defend their culture, and to strengthen the ties that bind them together as one people. And it's this kind of nationalism that I want to defend, uh, not for every nation in the world, because I only have five minutes, but for my adopted homeland, the United States of America. My case is, my thesis is, is simple. I think that the merits of American nationalism are considerable. And while I endorse it, I do, however, increasingly worry that the country may be too divided for nationalism to bring us together closer as Americans. That, in a nutshell, is my position. Now, before I explain it, uh, a disclaimer first. I want to defend a set of substantive nationalist ideas, not the label nationalist. So I, for one, don't really mind the term nationalist, but I think we all know how eager the left is to equate nationalism with national socialism. By the way, isn't it funny how they're never eager to do that for, say, democratic socialism and national socialism and to call Bernie Sanders a Nazi. In any case, I'm not a political consultant. So if the term has been unfairly saddled with too much baggage, then I would urge patriotic Americans to drop it. Call it Americanism, call it America first, call it Americans first, whatever else we come up with. That said, this is a debate about nationalism, so I'll stick to the term even though I'm not wedded to it. So to me, American nationalism means the loud affirmation that we are one people, that we are bound together by the mystic cords of memory, and that we share a common destiny. It means that we expect Americans to occasionally sacrifice for their country. It means that we expect immigrants to assimilate to our way of life. It means that we expect our government to always put the interests of Americans first, and to advance these interests at the expense of other nations' interests, if necessary, without, of course, violating the basic precepts of justice. Which, by the way, is what any sane nation in the world does. Poland puts Poles first, and Pakistan puts Pakistanis first. Nationalism, in short, is what I would call politicized patriotism. So it's cultivating and promoting love of country, that's patriotism, but in order to serve the highest political ends, namely securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So it's political, but it shouldn't be partisan. At least in theory it shouldn't be, but in practice, regrettably, it has become, hence my, regret, my worries, pardon me, about its ability to unify us. We're here to have a debate, so let me rephrase, re recast my uh, position in perhaps even more polemical terms to make sure that we arrive at disagreements. To me, embracing nationalism means rejecting the twin poisons of globalism and identity politics. These are two distinct ideologies, but they both undermine and erode Americans' attachment and allegiance to their country. Globalism does so from above, by urging us to think of ourselves as citizens of the world whose ultimate loyalty is to humanity. And then identity politics does so from below by inviting us to think of ourselves as victims of America whose ultimate loyalty is to whatever abreast community we were forced into because of our race, our sex, or sexual orientation. Either way, the attachment to the nation dissolves. At best, we can be American second and at worst, and this is increasingly becoming the case, we come to reject America altogether. That's the effectual truth of identity politics. It teaches us to hate our country and to hate our fellow Americans. Regrettably, identity politics and globalism are the ruling ideologies of our age. 
They haven't fully conquered the public's mind, thankfully, but they reigned almost unchallenged amongst the elites and the most powerful institutions they control. As such, and I'll end on this note, I am very regrettably skeptical of the ability of nationalism to make much headway in America because the one thing that should unite us all, namely our great country, is now one of the sources of our many divisions. Thank you. Dr. Bonk. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here and thank you so much to Dr. Azarad for his uh, opening remarks, which were uh, interesting and insightful and only at times polemical, but that makes it easier for us to have a real debate, so I'm grateful for that too. Let me start off by saying that I'm, uh, uh, like David, an uh, immigrant to this country, um, and I'm very proud to be a Newman United States citizen. In fact, I have a little uh, uh, pocket square and bow tie that I wore for my naturalization party with my friends. I thought the bow tie would be a little bit much, but I bought the pocket square today. So, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a US citizen and I'm proud to wear this little American paraphernalia uh, today as well. So I'm not um, a staunch opponent of patriotism or nationalism in all its forms. I'm aware of the many advantages that a sense of uh, collective sentiment uh, can have. Um, it often facilitates real cooperation. When you look back at history, people were often stuck within the schemes of uh, identity and of solidarity that were in their own family, in their own village, in their own tribe. What modern nations can facilitate is that somebody who lives, uh, you know, who may be a white man in Boston has real solidarity um, with a Latino woman in LA who's just been impacted by an earthquake. Those forms of solidarity, I think, are a great achievement that we owe partially to forms of modern patriotism or nationalism. I think it can also help to keep other rivalries in check at moments when we hate each other over our politics or over our race or over our religion or over which sports team we support. We can remember that we're all Americans and that hopefully makes life in a really diverse, complicated, big country a little bit easier. So I do think that uh, this has important virtues that I don't want to disclaim to them. At the same time, and making sure that we do end up with a real debate, I think that there are also real dangers to uh, nationalism, and particularly to the kind of nationalism that I take Dr. Azara to be defending, and we should be very, very clear and aware of those. The first is that especially in the way that nationalism has been proposed by Donald Trump, and rising uh, right-wing populists around the world, it puts a, a direct emphasis on the way in which the interests of the United States supposedly clash with the interests of other nations. It tries to uh, present a view of a world in which, as Dr. Azarad put it, we have to choose between nationalism and globalism. And that also means we have to choose between being proud Americans and being loyal allies to our uh, international partners, being uh, participants in sensible international institutions and multilateral organizations. And that, I think, is a very big mistake because while they're absolutely competitors and enemies that nations have in the world and while there are countries that want to make the world a better place who the United States rightly looks at as their adversaries, there are also many countries with whom we can have uh, positive sum interactions with whom we can cooperate in ways that make us both more prosperous and safer over time, that help us to realize the basic political values that help to define the American nation, not just in the United States, but in other countries as well. And that absolutely requires us sometimes to step back on our interests in the short term. That doesn't mean that we don't think that this is in America's long-term interest, that it doesn't accord with our deepest values, or even that it doesn't accord with the material interest of our own citizens. But it absolutely means that we cannot have a transactional attitude towards other countries and other partners in which we're always pressing to maximize our short-term material or political advantage. That kind of nationalism is actually harmful to the interests and to the values of American citizens. The second fear I have is that nationalism can become exclusionary, that it can become a way of saying this country was founded as a Christian nation or it was founded as a white nation and people who are not white or people who are not Christian will never quite have the same place 
within it. They have to integrate completely. They have to assimilate completely. There's nothing about the heritage that they bring, the religious traditions that they bring, that can become part of America. And that, I think, is actually untrue to the lived American experience. A lot of what America, what makes America great is the fact that we are one of the countries in the world in which people from different origins, with different cultural traditions, with different culinary traditions, are able to live uh, cheek by cheek and jowl by jowl. Sometimes in harmony, partaking in each other's cultural products, going to each other's restaurants, being friends, sometimes not so much in harmony with a neighbor who cooks food that you smell you don't like and plays music that annoys you, but we get along anyway. Um, that, I think, is one of the things that makes me love this country so much. And again, I think that there's a form of nationalism that really endangers what's great about America. Um, there is a little bit of a terminological debate where many people, as Dr. Azrat rightly pointed out, say nationalism is evil, patriotism is okay. They want to make this verbal distinction. I don't want to make that verbal distinction because the way to think about nationalism, I think, is that it can do great things, but it also always comes with attendant dangers. Mm -hmm. There's a good face to nationalism that allows us to have solidarity, to cooperate. There's also a dangerous face of it, which leads to international conflict, that becomes exclusionary, that leads to unjust treatment of minorities domestically. What we need to do is to domesticate nationalism, to use its positive elements in order to build a more vibrant and more fair society. But that is an ongoing project, and it will only succeed if alongside the virtues of nationalism, we also remain deeply aware of some of its dangers. Hmm. Thanks, Yasha. I'm going to give David just two minutes to respond briefly to your points, and then I also want to dive into some of the fundamental questions before we go back and forth. So David, if you would like a chance to respond. I don't know how we're going to fill up 90 minutes of this, because <laughs> we're going to need to find ways to sharpen disagreements. Okay. Uh, I mean, with the, the general points you're making, I don't disagree. Uh, I mean, uh, you're saying that on the global scene, we should pursue the national interest in a smart way, so not sacrifice long-term national interest for short-term gains. I mean, to me, that's tautologically true. So then we can get into a tedious debate about the particulars of whether Bush did that or Obama did that or Trump did that. But uh, the point is obviously sound, that when I'm saying that American foreign policy should be about the interests of America's person, it means rightly understood, so in, in a way that actually benefits the nation. And it goes without saying that that doesn't mean declaring war on mankind and refusing to cooperate with anyone. Of course, you have to cooperate. I mean, globalization is a fact. The e economies are interconnected, but you can uh, not lose sight of the fact that nations have a distinct interest and that there is not a global harmony of interest. That that's really what I'm pushing against is this idea of the Peter Singers, the Martha Nussbaums, all second generation Rawlsians, that, that we actually do live in a global community that is working in harmony to address joint challenges. We should try to address joint challenges, but at the end of the day, there is an irreducible element of conflict and disagreement that no amount of round tables and uh, international treaties will ever overcome. To your second point, uh, of course nationalism can become exclusionary. Uh, I just don't see that as something that worries me in America today. So that's probably something we're going to end up disagreeing upon. Uh, I could, the point stands not just in theory, but in practice, we can all readily document countless examples of nationalist movements uh, that take an ugly turn. I, I don't see uh, much or any evidence that this is part of America today that such rhetoric would have any great appeal. There is a fundamental decency in Americans that I don't see in 2020 any real risk that America goes white supremacist. Uh, there are fringe movements, they're completely marginal, their voices are amplified by the media because it confirms the view that America's racist and it's good for business for the elites and the left to always monopolize the moral high ground. Um, I, 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 so I wouldn't dismiss it in theory all the time. That's always a foolish concern. I just don't think that today in America in 2020, it's a particularly important concern. 
Would you like to respond briefly to that? Sure, let me, let me briefly respond to that. Um, look, I, I'm glad that we have uh, a good bit of theoretical overlap. I don't think we completely disagree in our view of a world, and that's helpful for a spirited debate. Um, but our disagreements, I think, are helpful too, and, 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 and they remain real. Um, I, I certainly agree with you that America is by and large an open and tolerant country. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, like you, I chose to make my home here. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, it is easy to overlook the ways in which people uh, do often feel uh, difficulty in um, having the same place in the American mainstream as other groups, in which in some parts of the country, if uh, you're not Christian, you are an outsider. And in some parts of the country, if you're not white, you stick out. That is not the case in New York City and it's not the case in Washington, D.C. Um, but there are parts of the country where, where, where that is the case in important ways. Um, to my great chagrin, I'm also uh, uh, deeply aware of the ways in which uh, racial integration remains a real challenge in this country, not just residentially, uh, but something that to me is a striking difference to other countries, even in informal ways in some elite institutions. The fact that, uh, you know, when I was uh, uh, teaching at Harvard and I would go through the undergraduate residence halls uh, or the dining halls, uh, you would often see uh, uh, black students sitting at one table with each other and other students sitting quite separately. So I think we should become aware of uh, the ways in that which that continues to pose real challenges when you talk to students who may be Latino first generation students and the ways in which they uh, often feel excluded in college in which they feel like the spaces aren't quite made for that. I don't think the uh, upshot of this is to double down on an extreme form of identity politics. I don't think the upshot of that is to think that America is bad or evil. Uh, but it is to be aware of the challenges we do have in uh, making space for people who come from different heritages and different cultural traditions uh, within our institutions. So my reaction to that is, and what about all the places in America where Christians feel marginalized, like New York City, where Donald Trump supporters are afraid to wear a MAGA hat? I mean, he was the duly, he remains the duly elected president, I mean, 2016 president of the United States of America. The, the, the people who come <clears throat> from your perspective, I, I feel are um, a bit stuck in the past. That this idea that if you leave the big cities, you find all these places where uh, the, they're teeming with hostility to religious and racial minorities. I, I don't see much evidence for that. I see much more evidence today in America in all elite institutions for straight up intolerance and hostility to people who are orth small o orthodox Christians, who are conservatives, who are pro-life, who have belong to the NRA. Uh, I feel that the vitriol really comes much more forcefully from one side. I'm not trying to suggest that the other side is free of prejudices, but I'm saying that if one were looking at the lay of the land, and saying, where is the real source of intolerance today in America? To me, it comes much more from the woke elites than it comes from the you know, ordinary American citizens who, to quote our former president, cling to their guns and their religion and have almost no cultural clout whatsoever and are openly despised by the elites and in the general culture. Well, the way that I would put it is that there are very, very different worlds in America, and that's, that's in itself a very good thing. But it does mean that there are parts of America in which uh, there's intolerance to people who are deeply religious or intolerant towards people who are conservative, intolerant towards people who support Donald Trump. Um, and then vice versa, there are also parts of a country where if you s openly say that you're an atheist, that is going to make you very, very unpopular where uh, being black or Latino uh, does make your daily life uh, that much harder, uh, where being outspokenly liberal makes it that much harder. So I think we all in America should uh, practice the virtue of tolerance. The question is, what kind of model 
do we want for what that looks like? Now, you said in your opening statement that um, on your notion of nationalism, people have to assimilate to our way of life. Uh, and perhaps we can dig a little bit into what we mean by our way of life. Because mm -hmm. on some uh, <coughs> interpretations of that statement, I might agree. On others, I would strongly disagree. Um, our way of life certainly uh, is founded on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It is founded on uh, the freedoms that come with that and the tolerance that asks of you towards your neighbor, whatever they do that doesn't directly harm you. Um, but there is also a way of thinking about this where our way of life uh, goes much further than that, where the assimilation is also towards a national uh, culture, cuisine, uh, way of speaking, way of living your life, uh, that I think goes too far. To me, one of the beauties of the United States is precisely that its uh, patriotism is a, a deeply inclusive and tolerant one and hopefully will become increasingly tolerant and inclusive so that assimilation means you're a proud American and you stick by the rules, but you can be Amish or you can be uh, uh, somebody who's, uh, uh, in your words, woke in, in Brooklyn or you can be an Orthodox Christian um, uh, in uh, wherever, which I would say in California, to make it surprising. <laughs> Um, Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, and, and, and nobody judges you for any of those choices, and you feel equally empowered to be a member of our culture. And I think we have challenges mm -hmm. on all sides there, and, and we should not trivialize the ways in which members of ethnic and religious minorities feel that they don't fully belong in some institutions. And we also shouldn't feel the ways in which some Orthodox Christians who might end up at, uh, uh, at my university might feel marginalized. I think those are both real experiences, and we should have empathy towards each. Mm. So I think one question that might help um, clarify things that, that at least is coming up in my mind is what is the glue that holds us together as Americans? So, so to answer this question, two, two questions uh, that I'd like each of you to respond to. What is the American nation? And do we have specific obligations to the American nation and its interests that we do not have to humanity at large? I'll leave it up to either of you to, to jump in first. What is the let American me, let, nation? Let me jump in on the question of what makes the American mm -hmm. nation. Um, now, broadly speaking, there are three ways of thinking about nationalism. One that sort of good liberals like me are supposed to accept wholeheartedly, one that people like me are supposed to be a little bit uncomfortable with, and one that we're supposed to wholeheartedly reject. So I'll start with the uh, orthodox part of it, the one that I reject, and that is an ethno-nationalism. That is a conception of nationhood that is rooted in the idea that we share an ethnic kinship, and that that is what uh, defines our nations. Now clearly that is the historical model of how many countries in the world came to have national sentiment. When you look at the history of Germany or of Italy or of many other European nations, their nationalism is historically rooted in that sense of ethnic identity, and you may never be able to uh, overcome that entirely, and you may not need to. But if you want those nations to actually be fair and just, to be vibrant, to have a, a decent future in which we don't have citizens of two different classes or two different castes, then it needs to overcome the ethnic element of it, because we now have a substantial portion of those populations, of those countries, hailing from countries that don't share that ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. So if you say that to be a true German, fully German, you need to have your roots in Germany, it will always create an uh, ethnic underclass. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, I think, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. can, now I the second you, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, what would you say to nations like Japan that are ethno-nationalists do not have any foreigners because they don't allow an immigrants? Would you tell them they need to open up because I understand the point of people are here who don't hail from here, they're citizens, they need to feel at home, this is their country. But what about ethno-nationalist nations that never took in immigrants? Do you think it's a problem that they still do that? Well, Japan is actually taking in quite a lot of immigrants at the moment because it has such a strong sort of problem of depopulation that the right-leaning government um, uh, is really opening up uh, to a lot more in immigration and a sort of guest worker program, but just as Germany's guest worker program, it's likely that a lot of those people will remain. You also have substantial Korean minorities in Japan. Now, I'm not going to prescribe Japan's immigration policy. 
if they prefer to deal with their depopulation problem without immigration, and they think that's the better way of doing that, that is their choice, and I don't think they have, beyond certain humanitarian duties towards refugees, I don't think they have an obligation to open up the country to immigrants to change its nature. Okay. But those Korean minorities in Japan, those workers that are immigrating now, ethnic minorities that may come, for example, uh, as the children of Japanese nationals and people of other races, they need to be treated equally and fairly. And that is not always the case in Japan, as I, as I understand. Mm -hmm. Now, very briefly on the other <coughs> two conceptions. The, the conception that we're supposed to like is the civic one, mm -hmm. right? It's the one that defines the United States by its founding ideals and by its constitution. Uh, that says that what makes you American is your willingness, as I was proud and willing to swear to defend the United States Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, that civic notion of patriotism speaks to me deeply. I think it is absolutely part of what makes up America. Uh, I embrace it wholeheartedly, but I don't think that's the whole story. Mm -hmm. Because most people aren't interested enough to pol in politics to debate nationalism for an hour and a half. Most people aren't interested enough in politics to listen to these kinds of debates. When you ask them what makes you like America, what makes you proud to be American, they might say the Constitution, but they're more likely to refer to other kinds of things. And so I don't think civic nationalism is, it, 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 it's important, I embrace it, I don't think it's strong enough to make up all of national identity. So okay. I think there's a third element, which is a cultural element. Hmm. But it's not a historic cultural element. It's not thinking about the, uh, the pilgrims and the Mayflower and so on and so forth. Well, that might be some element of it. It is thinking about our lived culture in the United States. Having lived in many different countries in the world, uh, we, over we underestimate the differences between them. Mm -hmm. um, walking into a pub in London is very different from walking into a bar in the United States. The cultural scripts we share about how to talk and how to interact are very strong, even among people of very different mm -hmm. ethnic and religious backgrounds within the country. And what people mean when they say, I love America, I'm proud to be American, often is those kinds of everyday parts of our culture that we tend to take for granted. And I think that too is an important element of a perfectly legitimate, positive form of American patriotism. David? Well, I, I'm glad we could clarify the first point that ethno-nationalism in and of itself is not necessarily wrong. That, um, you know, Sweden was founded as an ethno-nationalist state and it built itself up to be the country that all lefties swoon over, mm -hmm. admittedly. A very peculiar conception of Sweden, not the Sweden that bans Swedland, it. not Sweden, yeah. but Swedland. You know, they never get into all of the conservative things they have there, but that's neither here nor there. Look, Johnny, the question you asked is, you know, one of the most difficult ones to deal with in a country like America, which was founded as a small L liberal regime, where we were going to have at the national level, at least at first, the separation of church and state. We all know what the pluribus part is. This is a free country. If you don't want to speak English, you don't have to. If you don't want to eat hot dogs, celebrate the 4th of July, you do whatever you want. But then we need an unum part, because then we're left with a marketplace. Then we're left with a bunch of people who have no solidarity vis-a-vis -vis one another, who uh, are not willing to make any sacrifices for one another and for their country. So what, what should this unum be today? I mean, this unum has changed over time. We're talking about today. You know, I would identify four, maybe five things that come to mind. I'll try to make it as polemical as I can to keep <laughs> on. I mean, we're two Jews. We shouldn't have a hard time disagreeing, I, I would think. <laughs> I begin with um, an obvious one is a common language. So we speak English in America. A lot of people don't at home. The Amish speak, uh, I forget what they're like, Old Dutch, I think. Hasidic Jews speak Yiddish at home. A lot of Hispanic immigrants speak Spanish at home. But we should all learn English, and it's the language in the common in the uh, in the public square. And I don't think it marginalizes you that we all speak English, even if it's not your language. This is America. We speak English. Second is there really should be a sense of the greatness of America's past. You know, someone once said of Canada that the problem of Canada is too much geography, not enough history. <laughs> uh, America has a fantastic history. 
And it ought to be taught in such a way that it makes all Americans, whether they're first, second, or 15th generation, white, black, or brown, atheist, Christian, or Jewish, so damn proud to be Americans. We are currently not doing that. That is really something that can bind us together, what Lincoln called the mystic chords of memory. Three, you pointed it out, is it's not just the civic nationalism, it's not just the Constitution, it's the small r Republican creed of the Declaration of Independence. It's the uh, self-evident truths that we hold. The Declaration doesn't say all of humanity holds them, and it doesn't even say they are self-evident. It says, although I think they are, but we hold them. We need to have a shared political creed that all men are created equal, that we have rights, that the purpose of government is to secure rights. Fourth, and here I, I think I'll bring out more of a disagreement with you, is we definitely need a common culture and mores. It has many elements, but I, I do think that a defining component of it is that America was and remains a majority Christian nation. We are not a theocracy. We were not founded to be a theocracy. We shouldn't be a theocracy. But it is perfectly normal for Christmas to be a federal holiday and not Hanukkah. Uh, and I would tell a Jewish person that if this makes you feel marginalized or stigmatized, there's something wrong with you. Like you need to grow up and calm down. This is not an assault on you. Everyone's religious rights are protected, but the dominant culture will have Christian elements infused in it in a way that is in no way incompatible with the First Amendment, i.e. everyone's religious rights are protected, and then we are not establishing a national church. The government is no, not in the business of saving souls. But you recognize that the country's past native stock is uh, religion is premier interpower. Christianity is first amongst equals. And then the last element I would add that you know is quite helpful in bringing an especially diverse nation as America together is common enemies. <laughs> now you you know you can I'm not suggesting we get into a what's that movie called uh, Wag, Wag the, the dog. dog scenario where we cook up fake wars to bring us together, but. Um, you know, part of what forged unity at the time of the revolution was the fact that we had a common enemy, the British, the Redcoats. Uh, I, I, again, I'm really not a, suggesting we go to war with, with everyone, but it is good to accentuate differences with other nations. You know, one simple way to do it is rivalries. Uh, culturally, economically, in the realm of sports, this brings us together if we're all rooting for the same, for the same, for the same thing. But I, I am... I, I do not, it is neither desirable nor possible, and it would deeply be un-American to have a completely homogenous America. That said, I would not fetishize diversity. You know, diversity to me is uh, part of living in a free country, but politically speaking, it's also something to manage and to try to temper, and you don't want to let it get out of control because you could get to a point where we're just a pluribus without a nunum. I agree with some of these and disagree with others. So I think um, uh, uh, you know we 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 may disagree less than uh, any random two Jews you might put in a room. But we, we disagree <laughs> plenty. Um, uh, let me start with the ones where we agreed, but where I think I have a sense that you're worried about whether or not we're living up to them. You're worried about whether. Uh, this persists in the United States, and, and I just think those worries on those points are unfounded. So the first one is common language. I agree, of course, that it is very helpful for a nation to have a common language. It's not the case in all nations, for, of course. Canada or Switzerland don't necessarily uh, have one language that uh, all Canadians and Swiss people speak, and that's a different model of a nation, and that seems to work too. But the United States has historically had a common language, and we certainly want to preserve that. Now, the good news here is that we are in absolutely no risk mm -hmm. of losing that. Uh, if you go to a Chinatown that have existed for hundreds or, well, hundred or so years in many cities, you might get the impression that, hey, this has been around for 100 years, and I walk around, and most of the people here speak Mandarin or Cantonese, and a lot of them don't seem to speak English, so perhaps there's this whole little settlement where nobody ever learns English. That's a wrong impression, because what actually happens is that people move here from China, they often don't speak English. If they're older, when they immigrate, they might never learn English. Their children prefer to speak English to their native 
language and where grandchildren usually no longer speak the native language at all. Mm -hmm. That is the pattern that sociologists have found with Hispanic immigrants too. It is a very rapid process, um, and perhaps a melancholy one even, by which already the children of the first generation prefer to speak English even though they're still, they're still fluent in their native tongue, and their children usually speak at best a few words. Mm -hmm. So the common language is in no danger of being eroded, for I agree it's important. The smaller <coughs> Republican creed, well, that could be a whole debate of its own. Uh, that is very important. I think that is in danger of being eroded, but it is in equal danger of being eroded on all sides, um, uh, politically and, and, and religiously and ethnically. Uh, there is a way, I think, in which, um, uh, because of insufficient civics education and all kinds of other problems, um, uh, the importance of those civic values is being eroded, but I think that's a problem that goes um, uh, beyond one group or another. Um, the three where I think we have some bone to pick are uh, uh, common enemies, Christianity, and the greatness of America's past. So let's, let's talk through each of those. On uh, common enemies, uh, I agree that that has historically been helpful in forging a deeper sense of national solidarity. I agree that at the moment of America's founding, uh, the conflict with uh, the United Kingdom certainly helped to forge the spirit of a new nation. And actually, when you look at the Cold War, that's probably one of the reasons for why America was comparatively functional, comparatively effective then, because we did have this sense uh, of threat from another country. One of my favorite studies in sort of social or political psychology is you get a bunch of people into the lab and you give them randomly assigned two different texts. One text says, NASA has confirmed there's no aliens. How do you feel about these various immigrant groups? Like people's feelings are somewhat mixed, right? The other group is given a text that says, NASA has just confirmed the existence of aliens and they're really dangerous. How do you feel about <laughs> these other groups? And everybody says, oh, I love these other groups. They're much better than these dangerous aliens out there, right? Um, so, uh, so of course, it is easier to forge a sense of common identity when you have an enemy, real or imaginary, out there. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that is the way. But we shouldn't need that. We should be able to see what we have in common without having those enemies. And creating those enemies or emphasizing those enemies in undue ways uh, poses very real risks of its own. So when there is a real adversity of the United States, let's be honest about that, not mince our words, but let's not go around the world looking to create them because it would help us uh, build our own sense of identity. Um, on Christianity, I think that goes fundamentally to a question about uh, liberalism in a philosophical sense, not in the political sense. What is the basis for our living together in this diverse nation? And when I look at what has actually allowed freedom and liberty over the course of human history, it is a, a twofold freedom. It is a freedom of the individual from the state. It is to be sure that we don't have tyrannical governments as we did in a lot of European history, that we don't have discrimination against some groups by the most mighty Leviathan we have created, the United States government and other governments around the world. And so we need freedoms from the government. But we also need a second freedom. We need a, we need a freedom from our communities, because sometimes people might be raised in a community that is itself intolerant, that imposes its views on its children that forces them to behave in certain ways or wear certain items of clothing. And that too can become oppressive and tyrannical. So part of the promise of modern liberty is also that if I grow up in a family and a community and I disagree with them, I'm able to leave that fold and lead a very different life without having to run undue risks. And so a liberal political conception can absolutely recognize the value of religious community and the importance of it, but it does so not because it says, as Americans, we believe that Christianity is important, or we believe that Judaism is important, or we believe that Islam is important, because we're not going to agree on that. What it says is that as Americans, we know that many human beings have deep religious faith, 
have very strong ideas about how to lead their lives in a religious way or a non-religious way, and we want to facilitate our citizens' ability to do that. And so we respect the religious communities that they join or that they are part of, not because we are a Christian nation, but because we are a nation of free individuals and we recognize that many of our citizens imbue those organizations with deep importance. The fundamental building block of the United States is not the Baptist Church or uh, the Episcopal Church or uh, a synagogue or a mosque. It is the individuals that choose to attend those different things. One last point about uh, the greatness of America's past. Um, I'm a descendant of uh, European Jews uh, and large parts of my family were killed in the Shoah and the Holocaust. And so uh, I have a great appreciation for the greatest moment, moments in America's past, including most importantly um, its fight against Nazism and other horrors um, throughout the last 250 years. I think we should absolutely emphasize those in schools. We should absolutely be proud of those without hesitation. We also have to acknowledge that America's history has not always been great. We also have to acknowledge that America has, from its inception, been deeply marked by racial subjugation and inequality, and that it is harder for some of our compatriots to look at the great sides of American history than for others. It is easy for me to be more mindful of the greatest moments of American history because I was on the right side of those than it is for somebody who may be black, who hopefully does recognize a lot of America's great achievements, but for whom some of America's greatest failures are more personal. And so I think we have to have understanding and compassion for that, and we have to tell a story as our past president who you invoked with uh, his unfortunate comments about clinging to guns and religion did, by saying that uh, America is a deeply imperfect country, but there's nothing that's wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. And both of those have to be part of our national narrative, an honest embrace or reckoning with the negative aspects of our past, but also an unalloyed pride in the things that make this country great. We have, we have about 10 more minutes before we hand it over to the students, so I, I want to highlight more potential areas of disagreement for you both, just because I think at the theoretical level, there's at least some understanding of, of uh, in some in overlap in terms of where each of you are coming from. So let's get to specific, coming from each of your perspectives, let's drill down into some specific policies and see what you guys have to say. Uh, so three areas that I mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, foreign policy, immigration policy, and trade and economic policy. Based on your understanding of a healthy nationalism or patriotism or Americanism, whatever you want to call it, what do you think the proper outlook for those three areas, foreign policy, trade and economic policy, and immigration policy should be in 2020 today? I'll go first if that's fine. So obviously I'm answering for 2020 because policy questions vary according to time. So on immigration, I want something close to a moratorium. Um, since we opened up immigration in 1965, we have had the largest migration in recorded human history in the US, some 60 plus million immigrants who have come here. The share of foreign born uh, Americans is the highest it's been in almost a century. Uh, immigration politically only makes sense if it goes with assimilation, if it goes with taking the time to digest the waves of immigration, which was we did in the past. So what we did with the Ellis Island wave, which ended basically with World War I, but then they passed laws in 1920 and in 1924 restricting immigration is giving America time to digest these immigrants from Europe, getting them to become Americans. So today, I, you know, I make some small exceptions on the margins for people of exceptional uh, talent, uh, you know, scientists, doctors, researchers, uh, super athletes, but on the whole, I would say in 2020, given the divisions we have, the state of the country, uh, we don't need immigration for a little while. We need to digest the wave of immigration. Um, on trade, um, I, I'm, I'm not an economist. I, I don't have a, 
granular view of the matter, but I, I think that the neoliberal view is foolish. This idea that all trade is mutually beneficial is obviously correct at the macro level, but it leaves out the fact that you may have a whole bunch of people who are losing their jobs because of outsourcing. And then the neoliberal response is one of two things. Gain more training, or as the kids like to say, learn how to code, which is a foolish response for someone in their 50s with little skills. And second is, but look at all the cheap garbage at Walmart you're getting in exchange, so what are you complaining about? And take your opioids and be quiet. So, you know, I, I think it's perfectly legitimate in thinking about trade to distinguish production from consumption and to see the value in having well-paying jobs in America that allow Americans to uh, raise a family on. Mm -hmm. What the particular means is would be for a trade economist to, to discuss. And then third on foreign policy, I mean, I, I couldn't more emphatically reject the utopian nonsense of peak neoconservatism under the Bush years, the idea that we're gonna spread democracy the world over, that in the heart of every Yemenite, you know, Vietnamese and Mongolian is a little Tocquevillian American waiting to burst forth and do civil society. Uh, most people are not capable right now of democracy uh, and it should not be our business to actively be doing regime change and risking the lives of American soldiers to topple regimes. Now, I am not an isolationist. Fortress America is nonsense, especially in 2020. We are the world's lone superpower. We have geopolitical interest. I think, for example, it's in America's interest to keep the sea lanes of commerce open. Uh, I believe that the Monroe Doctrine still makes sense uh, in the 21st century, but the uh, excessive uh, enthusiasm for nation building and in particular military intervention to topple dictatorships and then hang around and do three cups of tea while they build democracies, uh, I think has proven to be disastrous. Well, we finally hit the jackpot. Right. We finally hit go. the areas where we're gonna have there two disagreement. Go. Now, now whatever follows is going to disappoint, isn't it? <laughs> right. um, uh, look, on trade, um, not all trade is uh, mutually beneficial, um, and that has to do in part with problems of distribution, even if it's beneficial at some level, at the aggregate, um, a lot of people might lose out. Mm -hmm. In theory, you can compensate for that through distributive mechanisms, um, uh, but those both turn out to be really imperfect and difficult to implement. Uh, and there's a difference between somebody having a job and the earned identity that comes from that, the pride that comes from that, uh, versus a check that they get uh, as compensation for having lost the job due mm -hmm. to free trade. So all of that is, is right. At the same time, I think there is an overly pessimistic view of trade that's been uh, adopted in the last years. American manufacturing, um, after a slump, is actually flourishing at the moment. And of course, uh, international trade has had incredible benefits around the world. I mean, we have lifted two billion people out of poverty over the last 20 or 25 years. This is, by the way, something that the left never sufficiently acknowledges. If you care to some extent about the well-being of humankind, the fact that two billion people who didn't have access to running water and electricity and a stable education um, and, 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 and a weatherproof home 20, 25 years ago are now living lives that may be modest by American standards, but which include all of those things is one of the great achievements of humanity. And I think we should uh, uh, value that. And by the way, America in the long run is only going to remain as prosperous and as powerful and as secure as it is today if it continues to be at the forefront of a global economy. And for that, we need trade and we need good trade deals. Now, that doesn't mean that every trade deal is a good deal. It doesn't mean that we should be naive about this. Mm. Um, but some of the fashionable uh, uh, opposition to trade, I think, is bad for the world and bad for America. On uh, immigration, um, I think that a moratorium on immigration would be a big mistake. Um, the first reason for that is that I simply don't share that fear that Dr. Azarad outlined. I think America and the power of American culture is much stronger than he says. I sat in on a Muslim religion class in Dinslaken in Germany a few years ago and the teacher was talking about religious tolerance 
and the fact that all human beings are the same, irrespective of a religion they might have. And one of the students who was born and raised in Germany, 12 or 13 years old, but from immigrant stock, uh, raised his hand and said, that's right, that's right, I have a German friend. He did not think of himself as German, even though he was born and raised in the country. I submit to you that it would be very, very hard to find an American 12 or 13 year old who feels the same way. All the American students that I teach at college who come from all parts of the world, an incredibly diverse set of people, they feel deeply American and they seem to me deeply American. They have completely, not just do they obviously speak per perfect English, but they have completely accepted the cultural scripts of America. They are deeply American and this is one of the great powers of America, though we do successfully integrate people. And by the way, if you ask people, are you proud to be American? Do you think America is one of the best countries in the world? Uh, all kinds of other questions about patriotic attitudes. Immigrants score more highly on them than non-immigrants. Some of the people who are most likely to have the attitudes that Dr. Azarot decries are not immigrants and their children. They're uh, the WASP elites that are much more likely to be woke and anti-American in the way he worries about than the children and grandchildren of Mexican immigrants, for example. Um, the third point is about foreign policy. Now, I, I agree entirely that regime change uh, does not and should not happen by military force. I agree entirely that it is a mistake to think that countries that deal with deep internal strife, with extreme material scarcity, uh, are just waiting and budding to become a democracy. But I also think it's important not to overstate in the other direction. Uh, to say that most people are not capable of democracy uh, is, I think, a mistake. Because most people are capable of democracy, and I think most people do desire democracy. For all kinds of complicated reasons, it may be unrealistic to hope for our countries to achieve that right now. But I don't think that there are people and cultures in the world that like democracy and others that will never have that aspiration. We should uh, uh, remember that the ideals that we believe in, the civic ideals that partially make up what it is American, are ones that are universal and to a large extent universally desired. Now, that does have important implications for what kind of foreign policy we should have. For the last four or five years, we have had a president who has had incredible liking for and empathy with every, practically every dictator in the world. I mean, what do General al-Sisi in Egypt and Vladimir Putin in Russia and Kim Jong-un in uh, North Korea have in common? They're completely different people, and yet uh, each of them was uh, lavishly praised by Donald Trump because he seemed to have a kind of attraction to strongmen and uh, dictators. He also, in countries around the world, was much more sympathetic to anti-democratic governments, anti-democratic opposition parties in some countries, than to uh, democratic actors and politicians. His um, close partnership with uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary is one of those examples. And this is a mistake, because America in the long run is going to be safer in a world in which democracies flourish. That does not mean we should go into a, some country and try and institute democratic government by force. But it does mean that it is absolutely crucial for America to stand with the democratic opposition in Hungary that is trying to oppose democratic backsliding. That we should support moderate governments in Western European countries that are doing battle with parties, many on the far right, some on the far left, that would try to destroy the democratic systems. So there is a middle way between thinking that all countries are just waiting to be democracies and dismissing the legitimate aspirations to greater freedom that most humans share. And there's a middle way between invading countries in the hope that we can simply plant a democracy there and failing to actually promote and protect democracies around the world through diplomatic and other means. Thanks, Yasha. And on that note, we will turn to our student participants from Wheaton College uh, who have a few questions for each of you. So, first question. Um, hello, my name is Sydney, and I am representing um, the House of Reps, which is the political science house on Wheaton's campus. And I'm also representing uh, Model United Nations. 
Uh, so my question for you, both of you, is um, some may say that in order to establish world peace, every state should give up a part of its sovereignty to the World Federation uh, and focus on foreign policy. So does militant nationalism prove a hindrance to world peace in this way? I think that's a question for Dr. Azarat. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea of a world government is, is silly and scary beyond belief. It's silly because it'll never happen and it's scary because it could only be uh, undemocratic. You couldn't have a global democracy. So I, I, um, that's not going to happen, nor do I want it to happen. To go back to what we talked about, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't cooperate with other nations, that we shouldn't join international organizations. I, I however, am quite opposed to the idea of the U.S. ceding national sovereignty. Uh, or the U.S. starting to think of itself as, you know, no different than Belgium on the world stage. Uh, that may be the case at the U.N. General Assembly, uh, but geopolitically, that's not true. In terms of world peace, I mean, it sounds wonderful. It makes for mediocre John Lennon songs. I mean, it, it's, it's another pipe dream. Uh, so long as human beings remain human beings, there will be conflict. We can try to, to, to mitigate them. And then uh, you use the term militant nationalism. Well, yeah, militant nationalism uh, has tended to be problematic. That's not the one I'm defending. I think for once we agree. Okay. <laughs> All right, next question. Hi, so my name is Mariana Sansoni. I am the vice president, former president of the Wheaton College Conservative Club. Um, and I'm so excited to be here, so thank you. My question for both of you is, how do you reconcile ignorance and blind nationalism often associated with Trump supporters at the expense of equitability and equality for minorities? Well, <laughs> I do think that uh, Donald Trump represented the worst version of nationalism. And I do think he represented a version of nationalism that in some ways was deeply un-American because it harked much more to uh, the European tradition of nationalism that is deeply ethnically rooted. Uh, the worst elements of uh, Trump's nationalism to me were uh, the moments when he seemed to call in doubt where the people who are not part of the majority population are truly American. It's when he called uh, a United States federal judge a Mexican judge. It's when he implied that Muslims cannot be loyal citizens of the United States. Uh, and just as there are uh, some intolerant and bigoted people in every country in the world, there are some in the United States, and Donald Trump gave a lot of uh, comfort and succor uh, uh, to those people in the United States, and that's, I think, something uh, for which he will be deservedly uh, remembered ill in, in, in the history books. Now, I also think it's important um, to resist the temptation to assume that everybody who voted for Donald Trump shared in some of his deepest vices. Um, you know, I think there is a temptation on parts of the left to, uh, you know, think about half of the country as politically irredeemable and to assume that we can simply ignore them because uh, of the demographic changes happening, which supposedly will favor the Democratic Party in such a way that he can simply vote that half of the country into oblivion, it'll keep shrinking and die off, and we can just sort of triumph by virtue of numbers and time. Um, I think that that is wrong strategically, um, as we've seen to some extent in the 2020 election with a huge swing of Latino voters, for example, uh, towards the Republicans. Um, I think it's also wrong morally. Um, part of what it means to live in a democracy is that you have to have respect for your fellow citizens. That doesn't mean that you pretend that Every American is a wonderful human being. There's bad human beings in America, as in every other country in the world. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't uh, 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 dislike some politicians strongly and uh, say that they represent the worst things in our country. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't passionately argue with your compatriots, but it does mean that you have to retain the hope of persuading them and of engaging with them and of earning the vote at the next election. And so um, much as I condemn uh, uh, a lot of the things that Donald Trump has said and done, 
Um, I'm also wary of the tendency that has brought out in many of my own friends and political affiliates in terms of how they think about the country as a whole. David, do you have any response to that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's not possible to defend every last one of Trump's uh, tweets, off-the-cuff remarks and observations. He clearly speaks uh, bluntly and indelicately. Uh, that being said, the idea that he's some sort of a proto-white nationalist, I find is utterly laughable. Uh, his daughter is Jewish, his grandkids are Jewish. Uh, you look at the policies he's enacted, the, the tenor of his major speeches, the countless efforts he did to uh, do outreach to the African-American community to pass legislation that would help them, how he was always touting how low the African-American and Hispanic unemployment rates are. If you look at how well he fared with black and Hispanic voters, not just in 2016, when everyone had told us he was a Nazi, but in 2020, after five years of everyone telling us he was a Nazi, he did better with both groups. Uh, I found that people on the left and the smart set of political scientists have a hard time accounting for that. So we're so, they're all so smart as to seem for the proto-white nationalist he is, but then Hispanic and black voters don't. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't see in Trump something to worry about, like the Fourth Reich coming to America. Again, that is not to defend everything he says or does, but I think if you look at the, the broad uh, substance and his political center of gravity, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll share a quote that he said shortly before taking office. He said, for too long, Washington has tried to put us in boxes. They separate us by race, by age, by income, by place of birth, and by geography. They spend too much time focusing on what divides us. Now is the time to embrace the one thing that truly unites us. You know what that is? America. Couldn't have said it better myself. So if I may just have a very brief rejoinder, um, you know, we could litigate the virtues and vices of Donald Trump for a long time here. I don't think that is quite part of what we're supposed to be debating. But I, I just want to note that to say that uh, Donald Trump's political statements are, as you said, uh, blunt and indelicate is, is, is to put it a little too delicately for my tastes. Well, I think that if the media had applied the same level of scrutiny to Obama's statement and had the same hysterical reactions to them, we'd have a different perspective on things. So for example, Obama said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. Now, of course, he said it in typical Obama fashion, you know, very calmly and nicely. Race is the tinderbox in America. There's been a highly publicized, disturbing murder and the job of the president is to weigh in and throw fuel on the fire by saying something like that. And yet no one seems to think that that is unpresidential, that that's fiery rhetoric because the media, of course, will never criticize him in the same way that they did Trump. And it was said in a tone that is acceptable. So, you know, if you start <clears throat> looking for statements that are, have done harm to the country, you could find plenty in Obama, yet for some reason. So, so let's, let, let's keep searching because uh, uh, I have to say that I'm a little puzzled by this as, 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 as an example. Um, what it took uh, Barack Obama to be saying at that point is uh, to express the special concern and worry that uh, many African Americans have when they uh, hear about things like Trayvon Martin happening. And part of that obviously is the thought that, you know, to me, I, I don't have any black relatives. So while I'm outraged by the injustice of what happened to Trayvon Martin, I don't think, wow, that could have been my brother or my cousin or my nephew or whatever it is. And I think what Barack Obama was trying to express is this very strongly felt sentiment that, uh, you know, look, if, if I happen to have a son rather than the two daughters he has, um, he might look like Trayvon Martin, he might face some of those dangers. Um, the way that you put something as a politician matters and the context matters. And in that context, I don't see anything dishonorable or disreputable uh, uh, about expressing that sentiment. Yeah, and I do. And then in many of the things that Trump says, I don't see malicious intent and you do. I mean, that's the disagreement. But uh, it's, uh, the hysteria is amplified by the media only on one side. That was my only point. It was not to say that Obama says all these horrible things and Trump never does. It, just, it is just to point out that the way we pr process and think about these things is very much conditioned by the culture and the media and the elites 
escalated to DEFCON 1 right away with Trump and were completely and have remained hysterical ever since, whereas with Obama, it's always been kid gloves. I think there's two different questions here. One question is the media treatment uh, of each of them, and I think um, you know it's debatable that a lot of the mainstream media is you know left-leaning, and that that makes them uh, uh, more sympathetic to the utterances of some politicians than to others. That's a point that's well taken. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't in fact a distinction that may have been overstated or exaggerated between the basic political strategy and the basic attitude of Barack Obama and Donald Trump. I think from his first entry into politics, Barack Obama always tried to emphasize commonality over division, um, tried strongly to appeal to independent and swing voters and was very careful in how he expressed himself, even though he clearly made some mistakes like the comment about clinging to guns and religion that you uh, 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 commented on earlier. I think uh, even if you tune out the media and are allergic to the way they describe Donald Trump and think that they exaggerate his vices in certain cases, which they undoubtedly in some cases did, um, an overall assessment of his strategy and of how he tried to provoke and how he tried to divide the country and try to l raise the political temperature um, will lead you to the conclusion uh, that, that uh, um, uh, blunt and delicate is the least of his vices. On to the uh, next question. Hi, I'm Sarah Mulder, and I also represent the House of Reps. Um, I'm a co-president with Sydney. Um, and my question to both of you is, um, do you think that if we abandon the two-party system, would we, would we be able to come together more as a country? So I think this is one of those questions where, you know, I, 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 I have a great luck uh, in normal times, not in this year of plague, to uh, travel around the world quite a bit and talk to audience in lots of different countries. And one of the things I find striking is that I often get a related question to the one you asked in questions where they have systems of proportional representation. And that is to say, oh, because of a system of proportional representation, we have so many different parties in our political system and I can vote for one party, but it's really difficult to foresee with which other party we're gonna go into a coalition and form a government, and that all seems very frustrating. Would we be better off if we had a majoritarian political system, would that be better? Uh, and I think this is a case of the grass being greener on the other side. I mean, if you actually think through what it would look like to have a system of proportional representation in the United States, you would have um, you know, at least five or six or seven different political parties in Congress. You would have, let's go from, 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 from left to right, you would probably have an economic far left party, some kind of socialist or, or, or Marxist party. You would have a strong identitarian party, um, perhaps a kind of Black Panthers-like party, or perhaps it would be a coalition party between Latinos and African Americans, but a strongly identitarian one. Then you would have a sort of broad center-left party, you know, which probably Joe Biden uh, would belong to, right? Um, then you might have a kind of uh, country club party, right? Sort of like Mitt Romney, you know, like center-right party. Um, then you'd likely have a, a sort of deeply religious Christian party. Then you probably have separately from that a kind of uh, Trumpist, uh, ethno-populist party. Um, and you might be able to think of one or two others. Depending on the exact setup, you might have a libertarian party or you might have a couple of other kinds of things, right? How on earth those political parties would be able to form governing coalitions? And how much each American voter would know about whether if they vote for the country club party, they end up in a coalition with the socialist party or with the uh, hard Christian party, um, uh, it's really, really difficult to foresee. I think it would be a lot of instability, a lot of chaos, and it would have other kinds of disadvantages. So in political science, there's just a basic trade-off between how much choice you have in political parties and how well you can predict what governments they're going to form. And there's no good solution to it. So that explains why you're frustrated by the two-party system. People who have a system of proportional representation are frustrated by their system. Um, given the constitutional difficulty of changing the setup of the American party system, and given that it doesn't have that key advantages, um, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a path worth pursuing or thinking too much about. We have time for one more question from our students. 
So what is the difference between civic patriotism and cultural nationalism, if you see any? So I'm happy to, to take a first stab at that. Um, so I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think my love for America is deeply rooted in civic patriotism. It's rooted in the values of the Constitution that I swore to defend when I became an American citizen. But it is also uh, a, a cultural nationalism. Um, and again, what I mean by that cultural nationalism is not uh, a never-changing idea of what America is. It is not an undue worship of what America looked like a hundred years ago. Uh, but it is my love for New York City. It is uh, my appreciation for the rolling hills that I see out of the windows behind you. It is an appreciation for the particular kind of way in which you do actually have a spirit of debate and uh, discourse in the States. I and mean, I'm not talking about the cable news channels and so on, that's all awful. Um, but the fact, for example, that when I studied in France, and I love France too, uh, but when I studied in France, students would try to gain the respect by the professors by telling them how wonderful the professor was and how much they admired everything they had ever said. Whereas when I was in grad school in the United States, you gained the admiration of your professor by challenging their ideas and engaging with them. So there's an egalitarian spirit. Um, there's something about a dive bar that I love. The w what it feels like to sit in a booth in a cheap bar and uh, drink a PBR and there's a particular atmosphere that really allows you to uh, plumb the depths of uh, your psychology and your friend's psychology as you're having one beer too many. There's just many aspects of what it's like to live in the United States. Um, and that's separate from civic patriotism. It's not in competition with it. Nothing about any of that stands in conflict with that civic patriotism. But I think that's what makes people who have a lack of living in this country love it, uh, have a special relation to it. That's what explains why Americans love America more than they love other countries that also live up to civic patriotic values, that are also wonderful democracies with good political systems. Um, it's because it's theirs. Um, and so that's why I think there's a distinction between those two, but there's not a competition between those two. Well, we will uh, conclude with our closing statement. So you'll each have three minutes apiece. And since um, uh, David started, Yasha, why don't you go first? Right. Um, well, look, I think that we've had a really deep and fruitful discussion about nationalism. Um, uh, you know, sometimes the discussions are the most fruitful of the ones where you, you know, denounce each other and disagree completely, and that's a good way of learning too. Um, sometimes it's when you share some precepts but also explore uh, where you're different. I think uh, uh, both Dr. Azarat and I have an appreciation uh, of the United States and of other nations. I think we both believe that there's really positive things that comes from that collective identity. Uh, uh, and I, you know, will leave this room even a little bit more patriotic and a little bit more proud to be United States citizens than I was this morning. Um, at the same time, I do think that our emphases of what the nationalism should look like and what it means for America's role in the world are quite different. Uh, I would urge you to consider some of the dangers that are part of nationalism, but doesn't mean that you should dismiss it. Love is dangerous. Falling in love with somebody can make you really hurt. That's not a reason not to do it. But you should be aware of the ways in which it comes with attendant dangers. In the same way, a nationalism can lead you to be intolerant towards people who are different, overly insistent on uh, making people assimilate in ways that uh, force them to leave behind some of uh, uh, the practices and, and the cultures that they come from. It can make you overly jealous of the interests of other nations, over attuned to whether you're being uh, screwed over in your dealings with other nations, whether they're taking advantage of you. Um, uh, and I think all of that would be a mistake. The United States has a tradition of patriotism that is inclusive, that makes people from different parts of the world feel at home and feel patriotic and feel as American as anybody else. It has a proud tradition of standing together with other nations in international cooperation, of becoming affluent by selling some of its wonderful products to the world and also importing them from other countries. And I think as long as we're talking about a nationalism that's intended to the occasional dangers and that has an optimistic vision, vision of a future in America's place in the world, um, I, I'm very happy to emphasize its, its virtues, but we, but we should make sure that it is an inclusive 
nationalism and one that is uh, attuned to the dangers of a jingoistic nationalism that pits us against other countries. Thank you. I, I think we agree a fair amount. There are some important disagreements. For example, we talked about the, the role that Christianity should play in defining American culture. But I think that really our disagreements spring from our different assessments of the threats facing the country. Uh, I really see the uh, alliance of the woke left and the neoliberal elites as the real threat for the country. And Professor Mounk is worried about the rise of right-wing nationalism and populism in America with Trump and elsewhere and in the West. And like all human beings, we react to what we see as most threatening. Uh, and I think this largely colors our positions and it springs from a different assessment of what is really happening, which is, by the way, what politics is about. Um, I want to sum up my position differently by invoking four core concepts as to what nationalism in America means to me. One is national pride. Our educational system, our culture, our monuments, our, mu our museums should instill in all Americans an ardent love of their country and a deep and abiding admiration for its accomplishments. That doesn't mean whitewashing the past. We all know America's faults and this is where we disagree is, if anything, we know America's faults all too well at this point. We should give pride of place to its greatness, past and present. The great deeds of the fathers should loom larger in our minds than their sins. Thomas Jefferson, the first association in the minds of citizens, should be the Declaration of Independence, not the fact that he holds slaves. That should come second. All Americans should look up to their country, and that sentiment should be harnessed to strengthen the ties that bind us. Which brings me to my second point, national solidarity. No more hyphenated Americans, no more dividing the country into guilty and innocent groups, no more grievance politics, no more identity politics, no more wokeness. Third is national vitality. Our fertility rate is well below replacement and near an all-time low. We seem to be lo uh, losing pardon me, the will to live, not just in America, but in every developed nation. The only developed nation in the world whose fertility rate is above replacement is Israel. Uh, the causes for that are complex. Part of it, I think, springs from the comfort that we have in the West and that children are an encumbrance and asking people to have children is a sacrifice. And if you're gonna sacrifice, you need to sacrifice on behalf of something. And the only two options we have left in the West are God and country. Uh, I don't think that nationalism in and of itself can lead to a birth increase, otherwise Japan's fertility rate would not be where it is. But I do think it can be harnessed constructively to encourage Americans to have more children. And then lastly is the idea of national sovereignty. No more deluding ourselves into believing that we live in a global community working in harmony to address common challenges. We should see the world for what it is. It's a world of competing nation states that compete against one another for economic gain and for honor. It doesn't mean that we're at war with the whole world. It doesn't mean that we don't collaborate with others, but it does mean that we don't cede an inch of our national sovereignty. We cooperate with other nations, but always in a way that advantages us, us. On the global stage, it is always America first, which means Americans first. So to sum up, I want to cultivate national pride and put it in the service of national solidarity, national vitality, and national sovereignty. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks, Yasha. Uh, I appreciate you both agreeing to spend this afternoon together with us, and I'm grateful for the students from Wheaton College that are here, and also to the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation for making this event possible. Thank you, and have a good evening.